Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Jeff Gerber for inviting me. Um, I'm a nephrologist, a kidney specialist, who 20-some years ago uh, deviated into the world of metabolism, and I've been studying me met metabolism and obesity for quite some time. And I suspect that many of you at this meeting have other primary jobs, but you're here because of your love of metabolism. Um, so I'm going to talk about our work trying to figure out the, figuring out the cause of obesity. So it's a big question that we're going to address, and it came with decades of research. Um, and um, this, these are my disclosures. I do have a book, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, and I've been funded by the NIH for 25 years. So the basic premise to trying to figure out obesity from my perspective is not to begin with the patient who has obesity and diabetes, but rather to go into nature because nature can teach us a lot. And in nature, obesity is actually an advantage at times. At times, it's critical for survival. So if we can understand how animals stimulate and, and develop obesity, uh, then we might be able to get some clues to what might be driving obesity for us. So for animals in the wild, it's all about survival. They need to have enough food and water uh, you know, to provide the calories and nutrients that they need. And if there's no food or water, it's a real disaster. And some animals will actually store food in little catches back in their, their dens so that when they're in trouble, they can go back there. Or during the winter, they, the, the little chipmunk can wake up and eat some of the, the food that's next to it. And we know the story, Vesop's Fables, where the ant was you know, storing food all summer long and the grasshopper was hopping around and playing. And then in the fall, when it starts getting cold and the food disappeared, the grasshopper had to go to the ant and say, hey, can I get some food from you? And the ant said, no, you didn't take care of yourself. So animals actually do know, you know, when there's, a, like, that during winter, there's not going to be so much food. And so a number of species will actually purposely gain fat as a way to store energy. The classic are the hibernating animals, like the like the bear. And the bear will maintain it a regular weight throughout summer. It, it, you know, if it eats too much one day, uh, it doesn't matter, it'll eat le less the next day. It kind of maintains a, a, a normal weight. But beginning about a month or probably about eight weeks before, hibern be before it hibernates, it will suddenly change its behavior and will get extremely hungry. It will start foraging for food. It will eat enormous amounts of food it will gain eight to 10 pounds a day. It will become insulin resistant. It will get fatty liver. And it gets actually all of the features of metabolic syndrome. And in fact, that's also true for the hibernating ground, ground squirrel. Uh, all these animals, when they are preparing for hibernation, they actually develop the metabolic syndrome, something that we think of as pathophysiologic, as, as a disease process. But for these animals, it's actually the normal thing. It's actually like, a, it shouldn't be called metabolic syndrome. It probably should be called fat storage syndrome. So the big question is not what, the, pro, the question of why they hibernate and how they hibernate is usually what people talk about. But actually a more interesting question is what triggers the weight gain? Why is it that these animals, which normally regulate their weight beautifully, suddenly lose this weight regulation and gain so much weight in fat? What's the process? What activates it? Let's be detectives. And it turns out that uh, for many species, it's fruit. And the animals in the fall, when the fruit ripens, the sugar content goes up in the fruit. And these, uh, like the bear, will eat so much of it that it, it actually seems to trigger the weight gain. And uh, it, it's not, I know what you're thinking, natural fruits, fruits are healthy, right? And they are for us because we're eating small amounts. These guys are eating like 10,000 berries in 24 hours. It's a very different level of sugar intake, okay? So these guys are eating a lot of fruit. 
And so let's talk about fruit and sugar. The main sugar in fruit is called fructose. And glucose is the other main simple sugar, and that's, of course, what's in our blood and, and is the main carbohydrate we use. In addition, there's table sugar, or sucrose, which is one glucose and one fructose bound together. And then we have high fructose corn syrup, which has a mixture of fructose and glucose put together. And fructose is the sweeter of the two sugars. And by combining the two, like in high fructose corn syrup, it makes the food taste particularly good. And they, in fact, uh, most uh, drinks, soft drinks and stuff, will have a higher fructose to glucose content because of the sweetness and the fact that people like that. So when, when we were, wanted to study this, what we did was we, we put fructose in the drinking water and uh, we had two bottles so they could drink regular water or fructose water. And we let our laboratory mice decide which one they wanted to drink from. And they would dramatically, of course, prefer to drink from the fructose bottle. And the ones that got those two bottles, they, uh, the ones that would, would drink so much fructose that they became extremely fat. They became insulin resistant. They got fatty liver. They got all the features of metabolic syndrome. And the control mice, who just had two bottles of water and regular food, you can see what happened to them here in this picture. So, you know, so basically we could show that fructose could induce metabolic syndrome. Now, it was really interesting. The first two weeks that they're given fructose, the first three weeks, they will actually reduce the chow they eat to, to maintain balance. So initially, they try to maintain their energy balance. But when you keep giving them this, this fructose sugar, suddenly, around the second week, they lose control of their appetite. And they keep eating. And they'll eat more chow and drink more sugar water. And so it, it's, it accelerates. So that's sort of interesting that it, that it disrupted this normal weight regulation. So the question is, how does the fructose actually do this? And it turns out that it's an energy balance thing. It's, a, it's an energy problem. And it re relates to the mitochondria, just as you heard earlier. The mitochondria are uh, the main little organelles in our cells that make energy. Now, normally, when we eat food or calories, that energy is used to make ATP. ATP is what the mitochondria make. The mitochondria churn out this ATP. It's the energy uh, that we use to do everything. And in the cells, they, the, when you eat a nutrient, it, they try to maintain the energy levels high. The ATP levels are high. And if there's any extra food, that, any extra energy that comes in, once the ATP levels are full, then that gets stored as fat. Okay, and so that's how it works. When you eat, normally, if, you, if you're in balance and you have good energy, your mitochondria are working beautifully, they produce the ATP, you keep the ATP high, and that's how it works. Fructose is the only nutrient that does a trick. And the trick it does is it stuns the mitochondria. It, it's an actual mitochondrial poison. We actually identified the mechanism. And what it does is it suppresses the mitochondria so that they make less ATP. And so they, they don't actually fill the, the whole tank. The ATP levels are kept at a low level, about 20, anywhere from 10 to 30% lower than normal. And when that happens, the, we all, it, at the same time, it blocks the conversion of fat into to ATP. It blocks the, what we call fatty acid oxidation. And so it blocks the ability to break the fat down to make the ATP. So the ATP levels stay low. When you eat, the energy gets shunted. Uh, toward, you know, it's an energy balance equation. The energy gets shunted to the fat, which is a stored energy, and not to the active energy. It's a brilliant system. And, and, and eventually, you cap up. The ATP levels come up. But it, when it's done, you've eaten a lot more food than you should for trying to stay in balance. And so you end up accumulating fat. It's a brilliant. So the biochemistry of it, I'm just, you know, just going to show this one slide. 
It's all driven by an enzyme called KHK, fructokinase. You know, the killer, hell of a killer enzyme. The, this uh, KHK enzyme uh, metabolizes fructose. It's the first enzyme in that pathway. And from that, you generate energy and all the things that, like all nutrients do. But there's a side chain. There's a side reaction that occurs when this happens. And that is that KHK uh, burns some ATP to make energy. So all foods require some energy to be consumed to make energy. But this one's like an unregulated train. It's like a runaway train. It just absolutely drops that ATP level rapidly. So there's a fall in ATP. And that accumulates this substance called AMP. And then they, that, that activates an enzyme that removes the AMP. Now, AMP is normally used to replenish the ATP. So this, we're removing the ability to remake the ATP. And at the same time, it generates a substance called uric acid, which is the cause of gout. But when it goes up inside the cell, it's the mitochondrial poison. And it basically activates the system that suppresses the mitochondria, blocks the ATP production, as well as the ability to recover ATP. So you have a low ATP state. So there's actually five steps in this process. It's amazing. It just keeps the ATP level down. And everyone who, with obesity and diabetes, the vast majority of people who have obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, uh, all these diseases have low ATP levels. This, as far as I'm aware, this is the only nutrient that lowers ATP. Alcohol does too, actually. So when we studied this, we found that it activated a whole syndrome, a syndrome that included foraging, hunger, thirst. Uh, it, it stimulates the accumulation of fat and glycogen and eating increased amounts of food. It induces insulin resistance and systemic inflammation and even raises blood pressure. And it's all to help you survive. This was all meant to be a good thing. The insulin resistance that it induces leads to less glucose being used in the muscle, which is an advantage because it provides more glucose for the brain. And some areas of the brain do not require insulin, not all, but some areas do not require insulin, and so it helps maintain glucose levels to the brain. It reduces the amount of energy that's expended in the muscle, so it reduces energy metabolism. So it reduces resting energy, but the foraging, when you're foraging, it actually does not reduce that. So you can walk and run and look for the food, but when, you, when, you, uh, when you're not doing that, you're going to rest very well. You're going to just kind of like be like a couch potato. And in fact, when we give fructose to our mice and we use laser lights, when they're, when they're hungry, they're, when the food comes, they're just running all over for it. But when they're not, when there's no food there, they just kind of lay there and they, they're actually very still. So all of these things, inflammation and, and all these things are meant to be a good thing. They're meant to help the animal survive. So how does fructose actually cause the weight gain? So it's like a detective story. So you, you, you're thinking about this, you know, well, fructose is sweet. It's, it, you know, I love the taste of sugar. I'm going to eat fructose and sugar because it tastes great. So we took mice that lack taste. And if you give them Splenda, they don't care for Splenda. They won't get a dopamine response. It blocks all artificial sugars. If you don't taste sweet, you're not going to pick a, an artificial sugar. But guess what? You, if the, you put fructose in two bottles, one bottle with fructose, one bottle with water, mouse that has no taste, he goes straight for the fructose. You don't have to taste the sweet to become obese. The animals will, will drink the fructose and they will get fat. So it's not taste, but taste helps them find the food. They'll, 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 they'll find it better with their taste, but you still get fat. So taste helps you find the food, but it gives you, and, but you, and, and, uh, and even in a, a, a tasteless mouse will still get a dopamine rush. So it turns out it's the metabolism of fructose. It's that dropping of ATP 
That's critical for why they like fructose. So if you block this KHK enzyme, so if we knock out that enzyme, suddenly the animals don't really care for sugar. They, they, they'll, they, they won't care for fructose at all. It's like water to them. They actually still like the glucose. So if you give them high fructose corn syrup, they'll drink a little bit, but they will be completely protected from obesity. Even if you pair feed them and give them the same amount of sugar as a normal animal. So it turns out that fructokinase is critical for this process. And it turns out there's a different, we did a series of experiments and we proved it was the ATP depletion that was key. So then we decided to knock out fructokinase in different places. So we knocked it out in the intestine. And when you knock it out in the intestine, animals don't crave sugar at all. But they still get fat if you give them the sugar. So it actually protects them because when they don't crave sugar, they won't eat it. But if you, if you give them sugar, they will get fat. So the, 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 they're paired together. The craving and what causes obesity are paired together. But you can separate them. You can create an animal that craves sugar that doesn't get fat. And that's um, this one. So if we knock out fructokinase in the liver, animals will continue to love sugar. They love fructose, they love sugar, but they are completely protected from obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver, hypertriglyceridemia, all those things don't happen. So there's something special, you know, about fructose. It really is driving the metabolic syndrome uh, and we can show how it works. It is possible to love and eat a lot of sugar but be completely protected if you knock out fructokinase in the liver. Okay, so then how does fructose actually stimulate food intake? Because remember I told you that when we put fructose in the water, you know, the first two weeks they didn't really eat that increased amounts of chow, but after a while they just became so hungry they kept eating everything. And it turns out that it blocks a major satiety pathway. Uh, years ago, Friedman showed that there's a hormone called leptin. And leptin is a hormone that tells you when to stop eating. And so when you eat food, the leptin signals to the brain and says, hey, you're full. And normally animals are very leptin sensitive. And if you feed them too much food, they'll quit eating or uh, they'll, the next day they'll eat less or they'll exercise more, they maintain their weight. But people who are overweight, people who are obese, tend to become leptin resistant. And so, what, you know, it turned out that if you knock out leptin, animals become very fat. So for a while, everyone thought, ah, oh, we can cure obesity by giving leptin to people. But the trouble is, uh, people who are overweight are resistant to leptin. They be develop a resistance to leptin. And what we found was that fructose causes leptin resistance. The way you do that is you take an animal and you inject it with leptin, and if you do, it will reduce its food intake. And it's like small amounts, it's like 10%. And you can see here on the left uh, that, you know, if, if you put an animal on a high-fat diet, they'll stay leptin sensitive. And so you can actually block food intake by giving them leptin. But if you give them fructose, they become leptin resistant. And then if you stop giving them fructose, they'll stay leptin resistant for a couple weeks, and then the leptin sensitivity will occur again. In, in our hands, if we give lard to an animal that's leptin sensitive, we can't make the animal fat with a high fat diet alone. But once we make them leptin resistant, they get dramatically fat with fat. It turns out that fructose makes you hungry by creating leptin resistance. And that's why when you add fat, you become really fat because uh, now you're hungry, so you're going to eat those french fries and all the fatty foods and you're going to gain a lot of weight because you can't control your appetite. And that's why when you're on a low-carb diet, you can eat a high-fat diet and you're not going to gain weight because you're leptin-sensitive. And that's why when you go on a low-fat diet, you have to do caloric restriction because you're on high carbs, so you're going to be leptin-resistant. So the benefit of the low-carb diet is to give you leptin sensitivity. That's one of the many. So that says that when you eat carbs, 
you become leptin resistant and that makes you want to eat more. So is it just about calories? Is it just the fact that fructose makes you want to eat more calories? So what we decided to do is to do studies where we pair fed animals, where all the animals would eat the same exact number of calories. You aren't going to let them eat more. They may be hungry, but you're not going to give them any more. All the animals eat as much as the guy that eats the least. So every day you count how much food is eaten, and if this little guy over here eats very little, then the next day everybody has to eat just that small amount. And so uh, when we ran it, we did this experiment multiple times, but it was very interesting. We put animals on either starch or sugar, and you know, so there was one animal who turned out to have cancer, so he wasn't eating very much. So it turned out all the animals had ate very little. You know, they were eating like 80% of what they normally ate. And at the end of three months or four months, we looked at them, and weight gain was the same. Or actually, they, there was no change in weight. All the animals, there was a tendency for a little bit of weight gain in the sugar animals because they dropped their basal metabolic rate a little bit. But it wasn't a lot. It really was subtle. But we still saw dramatic changes in metabolic parameters. The sugar-fed animals, even on a diet, became diabetic. Every one of them became diabetic. Every one of them developed severe fatty liver, as shown here. They developed hypertension, hypertriglyceridemia. They had visceral fat. They were a mess inside. So it turns out that sugar and fructose drives weight gain by making you hungry. And that is how weight gain goes. And that's why the energy balance people are are right, weight gain is an energy balance equation. But the metabolic components, the diabetes, the fatty liver and all that, that is independent of weight gain. You can be on a you know, di uh, caloric restricted diet, but if it's high in sugar, beware. So as we started studying this, you know, I was focused on fructose. So I thought to myself, so fructose is the bad guy. So when you drink, when you're eating sugar, you're eating fructose and glucose, uh, you know, because that's what makes up sucrose and high fructose corn syrup. And so the question was, what causes, is glucose uh, safe? And of course, this was going against, you know, what everyone was saying, you know, glucose stimulates insulin, insulin causes obesity. But we were finding fructose to be the culprit. So what about glucose? Could it be causing obesity. So we put animals on glucose in their drinking water, and they do get fat. They got fat, they got insulin resistant, they, they, uh, they got hypertriglyceridemia, they, you know, all the features of metabolic syndrome. They became leptin resistant. So it seemed like both sugars were bad. And so now I was kind of puzzled because we had two mechanisms. We had this glucose pathway that stimulates insulin and could cause fat that way. And we had the fructose theory where fructose is dropping energy and that's causing fat. And so the question is, you know, both are important and I think both are important. But I'm going to show you that the fructose one is particularly important. Because we had a surprise. We discovered that fructose can be made by glucose to the, at a level that can cause obesity. And so that when you eat high glycemic carbs, you can actually start making fructose in your body. And the way it works is this way. There's, a, there's only one way this can happen. There's only one known pathway. And it's called the polyol pathway. And when you eat glucose, it can be converted to sorbitol and then to fructose. By the way, sorbitol is that artificial sugar they put in syrups, <laughs> it makes fructose and it gets into your body. So, <laughs> so much for that. Okay, so anyway, so glucose gets converted to fructose. And interestingly, what drives that pathway is glucose loading. So if you put an, if an animal has diabetes with high blood glucose or a human with high blood glucose, they're making fructose all the time. It's been shown, you know, they don't have to be on fructose, you can measure fructose in their blood and in their urine, especially if the diabetes is out of control. 
If you go on a high glycemic carbs, you're going to make fructose too. That's now been proven in studies that are, were done in Switzerland. And high carb diets will also generate uh, fructose. So basically, when you go on a low carb diet, you're blocking this ability of glucose to, to generate fructose because you're removing substrate. So when we put animals on glucose, we found that they actually did make fructose. So these animals were not being exposed to fructose, but we found that there was base, there's a baseline fructose level in animals, and it goes up when you eat a high glycemic diet. And it's associated with all those features, but if you knock out that fructose enzyme, so that insulin's still working, all those things are working, you find that, that you can block fat, obesity, insulin resistance, it's, it's, and fatty liver, by just blocking fructose metabolism. It's not complete. There's definitely an insulin pathway there. So if you look at the fat, you know about half of the fat comes from insulin and half the glucose insulin pathway and about half from the glucose fructose conversion. So both are important. But the, it's really more dominant. The fructose pathway is more dominant. So this is a study where we gave soft drinks to mice and some of them lack the ability to metabolize fructose. They were KHK knockout. So these mice cannot metabolize fructose, but they have an intact glucose insulin pathway. And again, what we've seen is that we can block weight gain, triglycerides, insulin resistance, diabetes, fatty liver. It's dominant. So the dominant mechanism when, you're, when people eat carbs, the dominant pathway for causing obesity appears to be through the fructose pathway. And the insulin pathway is important as well. So this means that continuous glucose monitoring is, is, is great, not just because it warns you when insulin is being stimulated, because a high glucose also uh, triggers fructose production. So now we have it more, more complicated. Fructose can come from the diet, but fructose can also be made in the body. And you make it when you eat rice and potatoes and bread. You're making fructose in your body. And then that activates this ATP depletion. So when we were studying this, we go, oh my gosh, there's another way you can make fructose. And that is you can stimulate the enzyme that converts glucose to fructose. And that enzyme can be stimulated by salt, anything that increases what we call osmolality in the blood, can activate that pathway. And I became interested because animals use salt licks to try to help them gain weight before the winter, for example. And uh, the, you know, it's been shown that the salt licks, that it's actually sodium chloride that they like, and that they do this, they actually can gain weight. And there's even some places where people uh, give animals a little bit of salt to help increase their, their weight. So what we did is we put animals on salt, where they, they're, they're on normal diet, low sugar diet. These guys are eating less than 3% fructose. It's really, but if you put them on salt for, and they're, but, but it's about a 50% carb diet. You put them on salt, nothing happens for a couple months. And then suddenly, around the third or fourth month, they start gaining weight. They become obese, diabetic, fatty liver, insulin resistant. It's like scary. And when you look in their livers, you find that their fructose levels are high. So animals on a high salt diet will develop obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and it relates to you know, this production of fructose. So if you give a high salt diet to animals that, in which they, uh, you know, you've knocked out fructokinase, now they still eat all the salt, but they're completely protected. And what's more interesting is salt doesn't raise blood pressure or cause heart cardiac hypertrophy when you block fructose metabolism. So this has actually led to a whole series of studies showing that salt and sugar play a major role in high blood pressure to, by working together. So the idea that salt might actually play a role in obesity was very interesting because, you know, it, you know, it was kind of a really but when we looked in the literature, we found that there was actually many papers that showed that obese people tend to have high serum sodiums, they tend to be on a high salt diet, they tend to not drink a lot of water, 
They tend to be dehydrated. And in like this study, you know, they're, they're 12 fold more likely to have, to have dehydration than a, a person who's got a normal BMI. And when you look at processed foods, it isn't just the protein, carbohydrate, and fat content, it's the salt content. Processed foods have so much more salt and sugar and sweets, and the salt is playing a role. And, and now we know why French fries are particularly bad, because it's not just the carbs and the fat, it's the salt that helps convert the enzyme, activate the enzyme, so that you can convert that potato, the potato, the starch into to fructose, and then you have the high fat so that when you're leptin resistant, you really can add the weight on. And then we started looking at this and we found that high salt diet can predict diabetes and, and, and so forth and obesity and fatty liver and hypertension and chronic kidney disease. And you probably saw that the NIH just had a paper two weeks, three weeks ago or so showing that a high serum sodium increases the risk in the normal range, in the normal range, increases the risk for chronic diseases, dementia, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, et cetera. So why, why would dehydration cause obesity? It, so it turns out that animals, we go back to nature. And in the desert, you know, survival requires having enough water. But animals can use fat to make water. So fat, when it breaks down, can produce water. So fat is used by many animals not just as an energy source, but as a water source. And when animals hibernate, they use the fat to make water. And when the dehydration is mild, you stimulate fat production. But if dehydration is severe, then you break down the fat. So this, we started studying this, and we began to realize that actually, they're, they're, that uh, animals, when they get dehydrated, they produce this hormone vasopressin. And vasopressin helps concentrate the water in the body by reducing wa water loss through, through the uh, urinary tract, so it causes urinary concentration, likely reduces water vapor loss through the lungs, uh, and it lowers body temperature, which helps you reduce water losses uh, for what we call insensible water losses. So we started realizing that vasopressin was also, vasopressin levels are high in people with obesity. And in fact, there's a whole literature on, on this showing that people who are overweight will have high vasopressin levels as well as tend to have higher serum sodiums. They tend to be dehydrated. And there's a direct relationship where if you have a high vasopressin level, it will predict years ahead, years later, that you will have uh, obesity or diabetes or metabolic syndrome. So when we gave fructose to animals, we found that we stimulated vasopressin. And likewise, if we gave high salt diet to animals, we found that we stimulated vasopressin. And so vasopressin was helping the animal hold on to water. And then we said to ourselves, could it be, could it be that the vasopressin may drive fat? Because that would be another way to hold on to water. And so what we did is we took animals and we blocked different vasopressin receptors. And it turns out there's many different vasopressin receptors, three of them. But one of them, no, no one knew what it did. It was, it's called the V1B receptor. No one knew what it did, really, in humans or in animals, you know. And when, we knock, when that receptor's knocked out, the animals are completely protected from sugar and from salt and, and from obesity. So vasopressin is actually a hormone that helps drive fat. And it's driven by dehydration, by eating high salt, and even when you eat sugar, you'll become dehydrated. So it turns out that it's actually a fat hormone, probably more important than uh, other hormones that we know about for, for obesity. And that meant that you know, perhaps we could suppress vasopressin as a way to treat obesity. And so we decided to do is to, is to give water because water will suppress the dehydration, it will help correct the dehydration, it will suppress the vasopressin. And when we did this, we found that we could actually reduce the development of obesity and insulin resistance. We could intervene. And, and what we figured out is it's a, for, for people, you probably have to drink, you know that, where they say drink eight cups, eight glasses of water a day? That's a good recommendation. It's not a myth. It really will help you lose weight. 
uh, and, and it, there's a biology. It suppresses vasopressin, blocks the V1B pathway. So, as we started identifying this, we go, my God, we found this big pathway that's driving all these, this, this fructose pathway is involved in, in you know, how salt works, how glycemic carbs work, how sugar works, and it's driving this series of diseases. And we realized, and we just had a paper come out, I think maybe some of you have seen it, because uh, it's ha had a lot of press, but we think that this pathway can explain Alzheimer's disease. And actually, bipolar disorder and some of the things that we heard about earlier today. So just to quickly wrap up on this, you know, Alzheimer's disease is, due, is associated with these amyloid plaques, these neurofibrillary tangles con con containing tau protein, and you get this cerebral atrophy. And everyone who's been fighting, trying to figure out how to treat Alzheimer's, have focused on these amyloid plaques. And yet, despite 40 or 50 different drugs that have come out, only one or two have been approved and they don't work that well. It's like we're missing something. And so people started thinking, well, maybe what, what happens in early Alzheimer's? What happens before you get the amyloid protein? And there are three things that have been identified. There's insulin resistance in the brain, there's inflammation in the brain, and there's mitochondrial dysfunction, a low ATP production, a drop in ATP, and that is the biosignature of fructose. That is exactly what fructose does. So the question is, could fructose have a role in Alzheimer's disease? And when you look at the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, it's diabetes, obesity, sugary beverages, high salt diets, very strong, high glycemic carbs, very strong. All of these are associated with fructose production. And if you uh, do studies, uh, you know, like from the Framingham, you'll find that sugar intake directly correlates has effects on short and long-term memory based on how many soft drinks people are eating, drinking. And it's associated with uh, a re reduction in brain volume with soft drinks and hippocampal volume, which is the area of the brain that handles recent memory. So could, how would fructose cause Alzheimer's disease? So remember that fructose induces a foraging response. Foraging is like what's key. And for an animal, when it forages, it has to change its behavior. It, it, there's an urgency. They have to find the food quickly. So there's an increase in locomotor activity. They have to be moving rapidly. They have to be able to take risks. They have to have a quick reaction time. They can't deliberate. They, they have to make quick decisions. It's like you're going through you, and you have to be brave. You have to go into these areas. You know, being a scout or you know, foraging, you're a hero. It's a hero's thing. And, but it requires these behaviors. You don't want to have a lot of self-control. You don't want to deliberate a lot because you've got to make decisions quickly. So it turns out that fructose does this by working on the insulin-sensitive regions of the brain. And what it does is it's actually been shown that fructose will inhibit, a lot of it is inhibiting cortical activity so cortical blood flow goes down when you eat fructose. And it goes straight to the brain, the areas that are involved in self-control. And it, go, it reduces blood flow to the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is where recent memory is because it doesn't want you to remember that there was a predator there. They w it wants you to still go in. And, it, it, it's st and then in contrast, it stimulates like visual cues so you can see the food it stimulates an area of the brain called the anterior cingulate, which is involved in foraging. So fructose does all these things by suppressing the, there's a lot of inhibition of cortical activity. And so if you give glucose, you get the opposite. Glucose actually acutely, this is in the first 10 minutes before glucose can be converted to fructose. When you give glucose acutely to a human, blood flow goes up to the brain in the cortex, but you give fructose acutely to a human, blood flow goes down. And it turns out that, the, that foraging requires inhibition of the temporal lobe, the prefrontal lobe, the posterior cingulate. These are all to help you, this, this is all the way fructose stimulates foraging. And it reduces the energy required by the brain. Remember the brain takes 20% of all energy? Foraging is a beautiful way because it reduces that significantly by inhibiting these areas that are involved in control. 
And guess what? The areas that fructose inhibits are the same regions of the brain where Alzheimer's develops. And the areas that fructose spares tend to be the areas where, uh, uh, that are spared in Alzheimer's. There's a, there's a direct relationship. And when you look in the brains of Alzheimer's patients, fructose levels are super high. And so is sorbitol. The, bot, the brain is making fructose. And if you give a high glycemic food, or if you raise blood glucose in a human, you can measure the Im immediate rise of fructose in the brain. This was done by Sherwin at Yale. So that's human, human data. So we're making fructose, and fructose is dropping the ATP levels in our brain. And you can see that ATP levels fall in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. And so the, the risk factors for Alzheimer's stimulate fructose in the brain. Fructose induces, it's, like, it's basically a foraging response. It's driving insulin resistance in the brain, which I didn't show you, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation. That's all now been shown with fructose, uh, with models of Alzheimer's and also in Alzheimer's. And then you get the amyloid plaque. And if you give fructose long enough to a rat, they get amyloid and tau protein in their brain. So in summary, there's been a huge in, uh, increase in sugar. Uh, this has led to excessive fructose intake. Its stimulant was meant to be a survival mechanism. But if you overdo it, and that not just from the fructose we eat, but from the fructose we make, you can get dementia, obesity, fatty liver, dyslipidemia, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, stroke. And I, there's even a pathway through the Warburg effect to get to stimulate cancer growth. So we are not evolving necessarily the right way, and I want to thank you. <laughs>